This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Deputy Director Evan Greer and video producer Joe Thornton of Fight for the Future, a nonprofit organization that fights for internet freedom. Joe and Evan discuss the recent and possibly biggest regulatory move by the U.S. government since the inception of cryptocurrency that the Treasury Department is looking to implement, how this direct attack on the heart of the crypto ecosystem will give them access to users' personal financial transactions way beyond the government's current purview into traditional cash withdrawals and transactions if Bitcoin is used instead of Monero, and what Fight for the Future is doing to help the government from hastily moving ahead. They also chat about how people need to be aware of the impact of last-minute authoritarian moves and why crypto users should start opting into privacy-preserving technologies like Monero that truly protect our liberty before governments make it even more difficult to do so. Monero Talk starts now. Joe and Evan, thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for having us. So you guys are both with the fight for the future, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so I guess before we get into uh, how this is related to Monero and Monero Talk, uh, would you guys want to quickly explain what that association is? What it, what exactly it is you guys do, and how long you've been around? And yeah, I can I can kick us off with that. So I'm Evan Greer. I'm the deputy director here at Fight for the Future, and we've been around. We're we're a small but feisty uh, nonprofit that works on internet freedom and. Uh, tech policy issues, basically anything that relates to human rights, basic freedom uh, as it relates to technology and policy. So we were founded back in 2012 in the big protests around SOPA PIPA, uh, copyright legislation that could have led to widespread internet censorship. And we helped build a lot of the tech and messaging behind the massive internet blackout, which was the largest online protest in human history that drove about 8 million phone calls to U.S. lawmakers in a single day and crushed that legislation that everyone expected to pass. And since then, we've applied that sort of same tactic of using the Internet as a tool to mobilize people at an unprecedented scale to uh, take on issues like net neutrality, uh, government surveillance, things like the Patriot Act and FISA Amendments Act, uh, as well as corporate surveillance technology like facial recognition, uh, et cetera. So we work across a wide range of issues that relate to privacy freedom of expression, human rights as they relate to the internet. And I think, you know, to make that more succinct, uh, you know, we fight for a future where technology is largely used to uplift and empower people rather than exploit and oppress them. And I can kick it to Joe to kind of uh, explain how cryptocurrencies and decentralized technology more generally sort of fit into that mission, into that, uh, you know, kind of broader bucket of the work that we do, if that's okay with you, Joe. Yeah, sure. So the reason that we have taken such interest in crypto and we're working to sort of defend it in these various fights is because cryptocurrency and decentralized technology in general um, are sort of a next step of the way that the internet is transforming society. Um, When you can democratize something like access to um, being able to transact freely um, you know, with cryptocurrency, it really opens up a lot of opportunities, not just in, you know, the United States, but globally. Um, and that we feel, you know, broad access to, uh, decentralized cryptocurrency technology would benefit, um, pretty much everybody, um, and is a better system than what we currently have. How long has Fight for the Future been involved in crypto-related things? How long have you guys been actively talking about crypto, working on uh, movements that are pro-crypto? 
Yeah, I mean, we we've dabbled in it here and there over over the years, um, and it certainly has become more of a front burner issue um, just over the last uh, number of months as there's been these sort of more explicit um, attacks by the U.S. government on mm -hmm. crypto and decentralized tech generally. Um, you know, I remember <laughs> we did, you know, back when Bitcoin was like new, we did a Bitcoin Black Friday thing with a few other folks just to kind of normalize the idea of using cryptocurrency as something you can buy stuff with or, you know, that's like a normal thing. Give to your mom for Christmas. Um, and so, you know, that was probably, gosh, five five years ago or something like that at this point. Um, I should have bought a lot of Bitcoin then, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, so it's something we've been kind of, uh, you know, curious about and interested in and Joe, especially on our team, I think, um, you know, has focused on it the most. But um, yeah, you know, it's certainly, like I said, kind of just become a more of a, you know, something we've jumped in on more over the last number of months. We, you know, we helped build a page and do some awareness around the SEC's attack on Kick, uh, you know, the Kick and Kin court case and just kind of the potential precedent or implications that that might have. And I think generally we see that process of the government kind of bullying, you know, burgeoning crypto startups into settling um, as just sort of a dangerous, uh, you know, situation that just makes it so much harder for us to like explore this new technology that has so much potential to create alternatives to predatory institutions like big banks and big tech. Um, so it's a, you know, we're, we're some, we're, we're sort of new to it, but not uh, totally new to it. And we're kind of you know, excited to learn more and excited to kind of apply everything that we've learned in the, in the trenches of other internet battles and other battles around stuff like encryption generally, you know, which we've done a lot of work on as well back from, for example, the Apple versus FBI case and, uh, you know, generally educating the public about the importance of end-to-end -end encryption and the danger of governments weakening it or installing backdoors into encrypted technology. So it, there's a lot of parallels there with some of the narratives and messaging that we hear from the government around cryptocurrencies and particularly privacy coins. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing that's not going to go away, um, you know, with the new administration. And in fact, I think we're likely to see renewed attacks on encryption uh, you know, under a Biden-Harris administration. And I, I think in parallel, we could likely see attacks on privacy coins as well. Um, so it's something that we're, we've always kind of been tracking, but are now increasingly gearing up for uh, the battle and looking for an army. And I'd say this recent FinCEN stuff is our deepest dive that we've done at Fight for the Future on defending cryptocurrency. Yeah, so why don't we get into that? I mean, do, do you guys see that as kind of uh, the biggest regulatory move against crypto since since its uh, inception? Is it uh, something that's really uh, kind of um, crossing lines, uh, you know, that haven't been crossed yet? It feels like what what they're looking to do and the timeline that they're looking to do it within, which is, you know, just uh, before the new administration comes in, it seems like th this is the, the uh, you know, the battle we've all been talking about is actually starting to happen now with this. Uh, so, yeah, why don't you guys get into that, talk about a little bit about what the, the regulations are that they're looking to pass and what it is you guys are proposing should be done uh in you know in retort to those regulations so what seems to be happening with fincen really does feel like a direct attack on what is at the heart of the crypto currency ecosystem which is the ability to privately use personal wallets to send money from one person to another the way that this proposed regulation um, impacts cryptocurrency and private wallets is that um, when you are taking uh, any crypto from a an exchange and you're moving it over to a private wallet, um, any transactions over three thousand U.S. dollars in value um, are to be recorded by the exchange um, for presumably for access from uh, FinCEN in the future, and anything over ten thousand um, dollars is to be reported directly to FinCEN. And the problem here, which I'm sure many of your um, listeners are aware of, is once FinCEN gets access to your public address, it gives them a ton of visibility into all of the um, 
transactions that you are going to make in the future, transactions you've made in the past. It gives them vis visibility into uh, the balance of cryptocurrency that you hold. Um, and it basically destroys any amount of privacy um, that you would enjoy by using or, or like pseudo privacy that you would have through using a cryptocurrency. Any um, difficulty of like trying to figure out who's sending what is completely gone now that they have your, na your name and your public address next to each other. Um, so it just makes it very easy for them to track your um, transactions. And financial transactions reveal extremely private aspects of people's lives, stuff that should be private um, and stuff that just because you withdrew $10,000 from an exchange, these are not things that FinCEN has any right to know just based on that information. Um, and I'm actually curious um, from your perspective in, 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 in context of Monero um, with the way that addresses are like configured, does do you think that this would impact um, Monero addresses if you're withdrawing say $10,000 from an exchange? Even if they had your public address, would they be able to know any of this information through Monero? Yeah, well, I was hoping, yeah, we definitely would, would get okay. to those points eventually. I mean, the way, the way I look at this is, well, what's most troubling about it is, you know, uh, this new rule requiring essentially exchanges to re record if it's mm -hmm. $3,000 $3, or more or report if it's $10,000 or more, if money is essentially transferred to a, 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 an unhosted wallet is kind of the equivalent of going to the bank and taking out cash, right? And those, yep. those rules have already, already existed. And, you know, we're, you know, uh, essentially used to them. Now, I now I personally have issue with those rules to begin with, but there's, there's an understanding as to why those rules exist. And, you know, they, they invade, but at the end of the day, when you take $3,000 out of the bank or you take $10,000 in cash, well, because it's $10,000 for cash, when you take $10,000 or more, actually, I don't know what the thresholds are, but you take that cash out, whatever the threshold is, and that's reported. Once you walk away with that cash, right. yes, it's reported that, you know, Doug Tooman took $10,000 out in cash today, and maybe we should be wary of that. Uh, but what I then do with that cash is not known. Uh, you know, I, I could go to the grocery store, spend a hundred dollars. I could go, you know, whatever it is, buy, buy something from somebody I know, piece of furniture for $3,000. Um, but it's not known and it's not expected for me to report that. But with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular, uh, we, as, as we're all familiar with is, you know, the, the blockchain is perfectly traceable. Uh, and so now you're associating an identity uh, with a wallet and you're reporting that to the government and you're saying this person moved $10,000 from Coinbase to their to their personal wallet because they've stated to Coinbase and Coinbase reported that. And now the government doesn't only know that, but now they can watch you as you make every transaction after that, the equivalent of the government following me with my with my cash and watching me as I spend it. So it's not analogous to what we've seen in traditional banking. It's uh, a much higher form of yes. surveillance. And so, uh, you know, and this always takes, obviously this being Monero talk and me being a big believer in Monero, uh, I think it's great what you guys are doing. And I, I love that you guys are bringing attention to this. And I think, uh, you know, it is about getting out there and you know uh, making people aware that this is what government's trying to do and that they should give us a longer period to respond to this and let the people decide if they really want this regulation, if this regulation is gonna be good. But what I think also needs to be done is people need to be made aware of the fact that uh, Bitcoin is, is making it far worse because of the way Bitcoin is built because of the technology of Bitcoin and people need to be aware of the fact that they should start using cryptocurrencies like Monero uh, to, to take it into their own hands. So rather than expecting governments to do what's right and allow people to maintain those liberties, uh, they need to opt into technologies that truly protect those liberties without government's permission. And yet, to answer your question in short, 
One hundred percent. So if I if I take that crypto off of Coinbase into my Monero wallet, yes, you know that has to be. Let's say that's report. Well, Monero is not even on Coinbase, so bad example. But some other exchange, and now that's reported to FinCEN. They'll know that you know I I, I withdrew whatever it is ten thousand dollars worth of Monero. They'll know what address it went to. But like cash, like traditional banking. They then will not know what happens after I walk away with that with that ten thousand dollars worth of Monero. So I can go buy that piece of furniture or go whatever whatever it is I do with it, and I will no longer be tracked or traced. So I think it's important that people, and hopefully this will start to stimulate that people will become more aware of that. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Doug. Which is overall right, like so much of the promise of decentralized tech generally is creating these permissionless networks, whether it's for financial reasons or, you know, some of the exciting projects like Filecoin or, or others that are more about, uh, you know, creating potential decentralized social networks, decentralized, uh, you know, other methods of communication, for example, that are harder to censor, whether it's by a government or by an algorithm. Um, you know, generally, though, I think you know, and I do see that response, uh, you know, sometimes on Reddit or, or on social media, you know, privacy coin users or others will be like, well, like, you know, serves you guys right. Like you should have been using, you know, X, Y, Z. Right. Um, and I think I, I get that response. Like I feel the same way when I see, you know, somebody get hacked who wasn't using two factor authentication <laughs> or whatever. But yeah, you know, I think it's important to remember that regulations like these and and you know governmental actions like these do affect everyone, um, and they you know they have a chilling effect on the entire space, right? And so, to the extent that all of us would love to live in a future where things like Monero become the default, or the you know you know we have sort of digital versions of cash with privacy built built in from the you know, in the technology from the get go, um, you know, it'll be harder to get from here to there um, with, you know, regulations like these in place or with, um, you know, the government um, kind of targeting, bullying specific startups or crypto projects or trying to criminalize things like the act of writing code, right, which we've seen, um, you know, come up in some of these SEC cases where, you know, it really seems like they're, they're walking right up to the edge of trying to make it like illegal to write a write a, write some code. Um, and so I think, you know, that's sort of my response to anyone who's like watching this being like, well, I already use Monero. So like, this doesn't affect me. Um, Cause in the end, you know, it's really important to understand that, um, you know, these, you know, first of all, these types of attacks from government will hurt adoption, right? They'll, you know, like, I want to get my mom to use this stuff. You know, how do we get from here to there? Um, you know, we don't want this technology to only be for diehards or people who are, um, you know, super into this or super knowledgeable. Um, ideally, we want to make it something that's accessible for everyone and especially for people who've been historically exploited by big banks and, and by big tech companies. Um, you know, ideally, we want to make decentralized technology accessible, um, you know, particularly to, like I said, communities who have historically been exploited, communities of color, low income communities, um, others who've, uh, you know, often been discriminated against by big financial institutions, by credit card companies by you know the the institutions that hopefully this type of technology can replace and dismantle and so i think that's why it's so important that even those of us who are super knowledgeable super already doing everything we can to protect ourselves and our own financial privacy and security um to jump in on this fight and be part of raising awareness um about the impact of um you know kind of last minute authoritarian moves um by in this case mnuchin but again, you know, this is really not a particularly partisan issue in Washington, D.C., right? And I don't think there's any reason to assume, I, you know, I would assume that the incoming administration will be at least easier to talk to about some of these issues, but I would not assume that they will be, um, you know, immediately friendly um, on, the, on the topic. And so I think it's real important just that everyone who is concerned about cryptocurrencies, who you know, whether, you know, whether, and I know, especially on crypto, Twitter, et cetera, we have a lot of back and forth about, you know, I like my coin and I, you know, I like this coin, um, you know, and that's cool. We should do that. But this is also a moment to all come together, right? And say, hey, we, you know, we may disagree on a variety of different things, but we can all agree that this attack is an expansion of surveillance. 
uh, and it undermines people's basic human rights around the world and freedom of expression. And also to remember that you know actions the U.S. government takes have such an outsized influence um, over you know the whole ecosystem, right? Uh, you know the internet and this technology doesn't know borders, um, but the U.S. government has tremendous influence, um, and it does tend to have a you know tech policy decisions that get made here tend to have a broad ripple effect across uh, you know the whole kind of uh, ecosystem. So just a, a few thoughts there as well. Yeah, I mean, I can't agree with you guys more. I think, like I said, once again, I think what you guys are doing is great. Um, and, you know, I think it is a multi-pronged approach, right? So we have we have this technology and, you know, the cypherpunk or crypto anarchist goal of it is that it's not about asking for permission. Uh, it's about building tech that essentially is regulation proof. And that's great. But in the meantime, we are still dealing, you know, with the state and we have to deal with the reaction. And, you know, we should we should be uh, working with them uh, because the people are the state at the end of the day. After all. Right. We are the people, in, at least in this country. Right. So uh, a government by the people. So we should be working with our government to, uh, b you know, create a, 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 a basically a platform for these type of technologies to flourish rather than wasting time and energy fighting them. Uh, we should be. Uh, figuring out ways to integrate them to allow them to flourish because ultimately, and I'm sure you guys would agree that it's going to lead to uh, more liberty and you know more more wealth for all, right? Um, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And, and I think again, it. Just, sorry to interrupt you, but you know, just it sure. brings me back to the to the other crypto wars. You know, the <laughs> crypto means encryption wars uh, or cryptography wars. Uh, you know, where similarly, like you know, the government can't ban end to end encryption. Right. Like the math exists. People will always be able to figure out how to set up and use encrypted communications technologies if they want. And people who are looking to do really bad stuff like can and will access that technology. Right. But what government regulations around encryption do is they target a company like Facebook and say you can't offer end to end encryption or they they target the larger companies. Right. Um, which then hurts adoption, right? So it's like all everybody else, everybody who's just using their phone to communicate normally and doesn't think about this stuff at all. Um, you know, in the end, that's really who gets harmed by these um, attacks. And so, you know, I think again, it, it ends up being an issue of um, you know of justice, really, you know, not just of uh, of liberty, but it's one where you know if if we allow the government to succeed in these types of attacks on decentralized technology, what we're doing is we're then walling off this technology only for kind of elites, right? Or, or you know, people who are super passionate and kind of enthusiastic about it, but we're basically going to end up cutting it off as something that could uplift uh, our society more broadly, right? Or it could transform our society in profound ways that benefit everyone, as you just said. So, I think there's, you know, again, I, I think of a lot of parallels there just because we hear a lot of the same arguments. They say, oh, this is about stopping terrorism or this is about stopping, um, you know, horrible things like sex trafficking. Um, and, you know, these are real problems in our society that cannot be solved by um, attacking these types of technologies. Right. Because in the end, um, you know, the drug cartel is not going to be like, damn. Like, you know, WhatsApp went away. Like, now what do we do? Right. Like, you know, there's, you know, real, um, you know, you can't ban math. Um, and so in the end, really what this ends up doing is just kind of punishing, um, you know, society as a whole. Um, and, you know, the, the folks that they claim they're trying to go after, uh, you know, this isn't going to really affect them. Yeah. That's a really good point. Like one of the one of the points that I wanted to make about this this proposed rule is that if you think about it, it's only affecting lawful users of cryptocurrency, the people that they're trying to, you know, stop from committing, you know, crimes selling illegal things with cryptocurrency are not buying crypto and then withdrawing it from a from an exchange. They are selling stuff um, out like on, on the dark net or things like that. And they're not going anywhere near an exchange. So all these people that are withdrawing money and then being surveilled, presumably um, are, uh, are the ones that are being affected by this. And the people that are actually like committing the crimes are totally untouched by this rule, like whatsoever. That's a, that's a very good point. It's, it's, it's hurting the innocent the most. That's um, right. 
by by and it's it's stifling innovation in in a very real way potentially. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you guys know, but I, I ran for U.S. Congress, uh, you know, this past election. So you know, obviously, once again, uh, a big believer in what you guys are doing. It's not just about the tech, but it's about uh, working on the other side and trying to you know. Uh, change regulation or create create uh, an atmosphere for this type of tech to flourish. So, what do you guys see as what what is the goal with this petition? I mean, what do you guys you you think these regulations should just be you know torn up and, and never adopted, or you think there's um, some kind of middle ground that should be met, and you know they should just be adjusted a little bit? Or uh, do you see that there there should be no regulation of of, of crypto at all? I and mean, do you guys have an opinion there on? on what you see being the proper approach for the US government to take uh, in its in its uh, dealing with crypto? Yeah, I mean, Evan, feel free to jump in, but I, I feel like our goal with this specific fight is for um, FinCEN to, to just drop the, the rule here and leave things as they are and allow cryptocurrency users to remain private. Yeah, and I, I think to add, to, so that's totally accurate. I think, you know, in this case, this rule just seems like bad news all around, right? And I, you know, I think we would like to see it ripped up and cast into the lava or whatever. Um, that said, you know, I think strategically um, slowing this process down at the very least, right? You know, encourage you know the, these federal agencies have processes that are written down that say, okay, we're supposed to receive public comment and then we're supposed to deliberate and they're supposed to have good reasons when they make changes like this and they're supposed to consider the evidence. And so I think we have a very strong argument to make that is certainly reasonable on its face to anyone that, hey, this has been very rushed. There has not been enough consideration given to the potential implications for crypto users um, and privacy. Um, and so let's at very least slow this down and, and talk about it a little more. And I think realistically, you know, slowing this down past uh, the current administration and when the administrations change, um, you know, it's not clear to me how much support there is for this from within FinCEN beyond uh, Mnuchin, essentially. So I think, you know, slowing this down and giving us time to have a real debate about it um, might in the end kind of kill it. Now, in terms of your broader question of like, what is the right approach to, to cryptocurrencies in general? You know, I think it's worth talking about certain things. I think stuff like stable, like Libra, um, you know, which is not really a cryptocurrency in a lot of ways, or certainly not a decentralized one. Um, you know, we, you know, we, we as Fight for the Future are certainly kind of um, anarchists or libertarians at heart. We don't, we never trust the government is going to um, get it right. Um, but we also think harm reduction matters, which is why we have supported things like, for example, strong federal data privacy legislation to target companies like Facebook and Google who run a surveillance capitalist business model. We support enforcement of existing antitrust laws. Uh, you know, we support restoring things like net neutrality protections to prevent ISPs from abusing their gatekeeper power. And I think in the future, it may well be that there are um, thoughtful, um, you know, policies that could be made to address the potential harms of certain types of cryptocurrencies um, while preserving um, their potential. Um, but as of right now, this technology is still so new and, you know, the general public still is kind of um, starting to understand it. And we've seen time and time again that when politicians in Washington, D.C. try to make policy about technology that they barely understand, um, you know, ordinary people are always the ones that get screwed. Right. And so I think our general message around cryptocurrency regulations right now are let's slow down and, you know, see how this plays out a little bit. Um, you know, try to investigate, try to talk, like figure out, are there harms? Are there specific harms? How can those harms be addressed um, rather than rushing into any type of regulation, um, which almost certainly, is, you know, certainly with this FinCEN rule, but in general, I think any rushed regulation around cryptocurrency is gonna do more harm than good, right? Um, and, you know, that said, there's also proactive things that I think we should be doing to protect cryptocurrency, right? There was some good legislation that we saw a couple of years ago that was bipartisan, um, you know, that would have just like kind of so solidly codified cryptocurrencies as a currency in the US as opposed to as a security, et cetera. Um, you know, I think things like that, uh, Token Taxonomy Act, right? Was what it was, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I think there's, it's good to see lawmakers engaging substantively on stuff like that. So we're definitely not gonna sit here and be like, absolutely not, no 
policy ever about crypto, like burn it all down. Um, you know, I think we should have thoughtful conversations about it, but our core message is let's not rush into anything. Um, you know, this technology is still basically brand spanking new in the grand scheme of things. Um, let's be thoughtful about it. And let's particularly think about the impact on marginalized communities um, as we make any policy around this. Again, you know, one of my biggest concerns and, you know, I'll just be blunt on your show. And, you know, I'm sure you have listeners that come from across the political spectrum. You know, I'm sitting here as a big old lefty who loves cryptocurrency. And one of my biggest concerns is walling off this technology from um, the general public, from poor people, from people of color, from others who've been historically screwed over the most by the institutions that I think we're trying to replace. Other folks may have different concerns, um, but I think, you know, it's really important that we um, make sure that lawmakers are considering the impact on activist movements, on marginalized communities when they make any regulation around cryptocurrency. Because right now they're just thinking of this as like bank, you know, they're thinking of it as like banking regulation, when in fact, um, you know, any regulation around cryptocurrency has much broader implications for technology, for the right to write code, for freedom of expression, for human rights, um, for civil liberties, for privacy, etc. So we just kind of need politicians to level up on the technology before they start writing laws about it. Yeah, and and you you're you're talking about like taking like that regulators need to take their time and listen to people and not rush regulations, um, and that is the exact opposite of what's happening right now with the FinCEN rule. I think it's really important to highlight the fact that they are rushing the comment period for this. Um, normally, a comment period would be much longer, but I believe they only gave two weeks um, for the public to comment on this rule, one, one week of which we've already burned through. Um, so on January 4th, uh, one week from today, uh, will be when the comment period for this rule concludes. So um, it's really important that people, uh, you know, get online and reach out to FinCEN and tell them that they oppose this rule um, in the next week because comments wrap up on um, January 4th. Yeah, and quickly I'll say, you know, sometimes it can feel like you're signing a petition. Like, where does it even go? What is this? That's what I, that's what I was going to ask. What, what are you guys actually doing with the, with the petition? Yeah. And so the, the tool that we have set up at stopfinancialsurveillance.org um, allows you to fill out a simple form, just like you're signing a petition. Um, but we will actually deliver your comment through the, I believe it's through an API to FinCEN directly. So it'll be submitted into their comment docket the same way as if you had gone to the FinCEN site and gone, gone through their terrible UX to do it. Um, and, you know, this is something that we've done with the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, around net neutrality. We drove millions of comments to them on that issue. Um, and, you know, again, government agencies can and will ignore comments from the public and just do stuff, but they're not supposed to. And so what this can also lead to is the potential in the future for lawsuits, um, for example, that could cite the fact that there's overwhelming opposition in the docket. Why did they go ahead and do this anyway? Um, it can lead to uh, congressional action where we start to see oversight from Congress where they're saying, hey, you know, the docket on this issue shows that 90% of the comments were opposed to this rule. Why did you go ahead and do it anyway? Um, and so uh, I think it's important, you know, again, I'm highly skeptical of government generally and, and, and don't kind of ever assume that they're just going to listen to us. But what we've seen time and time again is that when we can use the internet to mobilize this type of massive public opposition, it can and will slow them down. It can force them to reconsider. It can force them to address issues. Um, and I think in this case, it's really all about making noise, right? Uh, uh, we've heard that there are folks in FinCEN who are not super thrilled about this rule, that this is really being driven specifically by uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. Um, although, you know, certainly there are plenty of others there who I think, uh, you know, share his views. Um, but again, I think if we can make some noise about this, we might have some friends inside the building, um, you know, ideologically. Um, and I think also just uh, it, it is important to remember that in the end, uh, you know, policymakers make policy based on what they think will, uh, you know, keep them in power. And so if we can convince them that uh, doing this is more painful than not doing it, um, we can live in a scenario where they don't do it or where at least they slow it down and reconsider. Um, which I think is what we're going for here. 
Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's well, the crypto community is a lot stronger than it used to be, obviously. But uh, even still, you know, it's a relatively small. Everybody knows about Bitcoin and knows about crypto at this point. But actually, people that are in the community and, you know, really into it for for the ideal ideological reasons, it's 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 still, I'm assuming, relatively small. So it, it's tough when you have, you know, something like this come down for the government. Uh, it's it's really a minority that needs to you know kind of rise up and have a voice, and you know uh, a lot of the ethos of the crypto community, particularly the Monero community, is to kind of you know uh, stay back, stay away, stay hidden, stay anonymous. So to come out, fill out a form, or be active and send a letter to your congressperson, it's just not things that uh, crypto anarchists are looking to do. They want to they want to stay under the radar. So it's 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 a little uh, it's unfortunate uh, that that's the case. That's one of the reasons, once again, why I was trying to run because I thought you know you needed somebody to step up and step out uh, and to say these things, even though you know I personally you know ha had. Uh, you know, mixed feelings about being that person because I, I, I too have this very much this, this crypto anarchist philosophy. So uh, it's it's unfortunate. So anybody listening, I would say, you know, try to in some way, you know, get the word out there. Even if you want to maintain, uh, stay anonymous, uh, you could, I, I guess there's still things you can do, right? You could anonymously write your congressperson or anonymously uh, submit a comment, uh, but don't let it, you know, don't let it languish, you know, try to do something, take action. Um, and like you said, even if it doesn't make a difference now, it at least brings exposure and attention to the fact that this is what the government's trying to do. And they're doing it in an unfair way and that they're not giving, you know, a proper amount of time for people uh, to to be able to comment. And, you know, this is this is this is what we need to pay attention to and not let governments do that to us, because we, we should be the ones essentially uh, making the rules for ourselves. Uh, so yeah, once again, I, I you know I, I love what you guys are doing. Um, do you think there is anything else people can do other than you know signing signing your petition? What else would you recommend? Yeah, well, so I mean, not to get too much of a make too much of a plug, but um, you know, certainly organizations like ours and the Electronic Frontier Foundation and others are out here advocating on these issues um, and speaking up um, and specifically speaking up from a privacy, uh, human rights, free expression perspective. And, you know, you can donate to us if you want to stay anonymous in the background and let others kind of do the battle. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We also have a 501c4 arm that lets us um, kind of do, uh, you know, direct, uh, you know, mobilization against or for specific legislation. Um, we accept Monero and all other cryptocurrencies, so you can certainly throw us a little bit of money um, if you want to support in that way. I think also, you know, just talking to people about it, um, you know, and especially reaching out to the pro, you know, if you've got a crypto project that you really love and you think they're doing something cool, you know, make sure that this is on their radar and encourage them to speak out about it because, you know, likely those those devs or whoever, maybe they're already pretty public or, you know, they, they um, you know, and uh, hearing from those, you know, founders or startups or, you know, actual businesses um, is one thing that does have a dramatic impact on the government, right? Particular, you know, no, no Republican or Democrat wants to be seen as, you know, crushing the little small business owner who's just trying to create a cool new thing um, or, you know, the volunteer crypto project. Um, and so I think, you know, just speak, you know, even just within the community, encouraging those who are able to speak out, I think, makes a big difference. Um, but, you know, that said, I think, you know, it's good to keep in mind, too, you know, what what are you trying to keep private and from whom? Right. Uh, you know, I think it's always good to just think about threat models. And, um, you know, yeah, I you know, I, I am extremely concerned about government surveillance, um, you know, fight for the future ourselves have been subject to corporate surveillance where we were targeted by persistent phishing campaigns paid for by some of our corporate adversaries. So I certainly, you know, have a lot of privacy concerns myself. But I've decided, you know, that, you know, being public about this work is, is part of, um, you know, is important um, and is worth the risk um, to take the fight to where it needs to be. So, you know, if you can step up and join us. That's great. If you can't and want to make a donation or something, that's also great. Um, but mostly, I think just, you know, let's not be silent about this. Um, you know, the more noise we can make, the better. What do you think the strategy was? Uh, why, why do you think the Treasury Department, uh, Mnuchin, is trying to do it now? 
Well, clearly this is a, you know, midnight rulemaking, right? I mean, they're mm-hmm. trying to do this at the last minute when they're on their way out um, and over the holidays while everyone is, you know, uh, you know, not paying attention and or up at their parents' house or whatever uh, safely. Um, but, um, you know, so I think, you know, I, I don't think the timing is a coincidence. I don't know how much it's a, you know, super capital C conspiracy either. I'm sure, you know, it just takes them a while to get their act together, but this is clearly their, their closing move. Um, and so, you know, that both makes it challenging to fight, but I think also makes it all the more important to mobilize around because if we can delay this, um, you know, if we can get them to open another comment period or roll back the rule, uh, I think it's very likely that this could go away. Um, you know, in, in in the near future, and or that we'll see. You know, and not to say we won't see many other attacks or or fights, but um, I think that's the goal here. Do you think going out in, in the physical, going down to DC? I mean, you never you never see crypto people really doing that yet. Like, right? Actually, uh, taking it to the streets. Do you think? Mm. Do you think the time has come for something like that? Uh, do you do you see that uh, being necessary at some point to bring attention to these issues? You know, it certainly could get to that point, and obviously, you know, there are ways to do that safely, uh, even in during the pandemic, um, if you, if you're thoughtful about it. Um, but you know, I think right now it, it's all about FinCEN, right? And these guys are they are they're bureaucrats, right? And so, to a certain extent, I think it actually is is. Right now, the strategy is more about just getting in those comments and getting in substantive comments. You know, if you fill out the form on our page, stopfinancialsurveillance.org, you know, we have a default comment that you can use. But really, if you have the time and the knowledge, you should write your own comment about why this is important to you and why, how this would affect you, your business, your family, your community, um, the things that you care about. Because those substantive comments actually really do matter. And you know, they, these, You know, bureaucrats in this case, they think are less swayed by people banging pots and pans outside their office, um, which they're not even in right now, (laughs) um, than they will be by kind of, you know, really driving a significant number of substantive comments into this, uh, into their docket, um, getting some press coverage, things like that. Um, You know, so certainly, you know, we've organized in-person protests on everything from encryption to surveillance, net neutrality. We're all about it. Uh, you know, we, we were blocking Tom Wheeler, the chairman of the FCC's driveway in the morning that the Obama administration finally caved on Title II net neutrality. Um, so we're, we're no stranger to in-person protests, civil disobedience, things like that. But I think, you know, we should keep some of our powder dry for, um, for the future. And right now, I think it's really about getting in these comments, raising awareness uh, and getting people to pay attention to this, sounding the alarm. This is the moment to sound the alarm. Um, and, you know, but we, you know, we need to be starting to build a movement, a cross-partisan movement, um, people from across the political spectrum who understand the importance of this technology coming together to defend it, um, because we see lawmakers from across the political spectrum coming together to try to crush it. So I think, you know, now's our moment, um, and we're going to have to come together to fight. And I think a reason that Monero users should really care about this fight, even though they aren't affected by it, um, is because you know, privacy coins, I, I see being being next. Um, when w- say they pass this uh, rule and they are, you know, doing tons of financial surveillance on crypto users, it's not going to take them long to figure out, oh, there's this big hole in our information here. We can't see anything these Monero users are doing because clearly the goal here is financial surveillance. And privacy coins like Monero are going to be next. And I know that obviously they can't ban math, they can't make cryptography useless, but they certainly can go to the exchanges and say, you know, you can't sell any Monero. They can, they can put up roadblocks in all different ways other than literally like, you know, just banning, banning the the math, which is obviously impossible, but they can, they can make it really difficult for Monero users um, down the line. So it's 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 in everybody's best interest who is part of the crypto community to nip this in the bud, even if it doesn't directly affect your coin of choice. Definitely, yeah, couldn't agree with you more there. Uh, I would encourage people. I don't know if, and I'd like to hear if you guys would to uh, you know consider you know moving some of your funds into into Monero. Uh, 
now sooner, you know, uh, protest in that way or take action in that way if you're a Bitcoiner, you know, because I mean, that, that's a big part of and I'd like to hear you guys opinion on this. You know, Bitcoin is great. Uh, it, it's skyrocketing in value. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's the mother of all crypto. And, you know, it's brought us this far. Uh, but it's concerning that, you know, at the core protocol level, it is transparent. And that, you know, a lot of people in the Bitcoin community just kind of assuage that, you know, and they, 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 they're okay with that. They're like, well, you know, the number keeps going up, so it, it, it's not bad. Uh, but would you encourage people to move over to something like Monero uh, and start bringing attention to it? Because, I mean, that's how, uh, you know, we fight back by, you know, changing, you know, fighting against regulations. But we also fight back by uh, making sure something like Monero uh, reaches that, you know, th maintains that network effect or reaches that point where it can't be shut down. Uh, and, you know, that happens with more people using it. Uh, and, you know, if, if the governments do react by seeing that, all right, well, we, we've taken care of Bitcoin, we can basically track and trace Bitcoin, but now there is this other thing and they react by saying, well, let's make it really difficult for people to use Monero. Uh, is now the time to start to move over to that uh, so that the network becomes stronger now before they really attack it? Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly just jump in and say that I've I've made a promise to myself that the only crypto advice that I give is that you should give it to me and my organization to do our work. <laughs> Beyond that, I you know I I think it's our role as advocates to fight for your right. To make that decision, right? Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, we, you know, we, we don't, we try to avoid kind of making recommendations one way or the other about, you know, what people should use or buy. Um, but I think it's super important that we defend people's right to to make those decisions, to inform themselves, and people can and should inform themselves about, um, you know, taking precautions to protect their privacy and surveillance. And you know, certainly, um, you know, using a more privacy-minded coin makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, so. Generally, you know, we're not going to tell people go put all your money in this or that, um, you know. But uh, you know, I think you know everything you're saying makes a lot of sense to me, and um, I think generally speaking, um, everyone should you know do their best to educate themselves and their community about um, different options and technology, and and also just think about you know it also depends on you know what, again what your what your threat model is, what you're concerned about, um, and uh, you know what what you're using this for. Um, so. Everyone's situation is different, and that's why we, as advocates, um, are out here fighting for your right to make those decisions, um, rather than telling you what you should do. Are you guys concerned about Bitcoin as a technology? So I understand, you know, it's cryptocurrency, right? So yeah, I, I'm not advocating for anybody to throw all their money into any particular crypto either, right? Right. So because it is a financial investment after all. So you have, but but it's also a technology that's here. That's you know. Uh, the purpose of it is to liberate, right? And so it's like, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys would add, or maybe not, uh, do you advocate for people to use technologies like Tor and, you know, use HTTPS versus, you know, without the S? Uh, I mean, I I'm sure you guys advocate for those uses of technology. Why, why the difference with crypto and, uh, do you think we should start to push people towards taking these actions? Because how else is it going to happen? You get what I'm saying? Like, I'm a little concerned. Yeah, no, I, I totally get what you're saying. It's kind it's of like, totally, it's, a, it's a valid question. I mean, really, the, the honest answer is just that it's still relatively new mm -hmm. for us. And so we're, you know, we just want to be cautious and thoughtful about how we enter into the space. And so even, you know, having conversations like this helps educate us and, and get into it. You know, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, we do, you know, we do issue recommendations that like that everyone should be using two factor authentication on all their accounts and should use, you know, end to end encrypted services like Signal instead of SMS, etc. So it's a totally valid comparison. And, uh, you know, but I think just where we're at with it at this point is we're, you know, we think all of this stuff is still relatively new. Um, you know, there's potential benefits to some of the transparent blockchain stuff as well, I think that are worth thinking about. Um, and so I think, you know, I just think we're 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 learning about it along with everyone else, um, and want to be thoughtful about how we enter into the space and see our primary role as an internet freedom organization to be to keep the government from killing this stuff before people have a chance to you know 
you know, decide, you know, what, what's the best way to go. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Uh, I think we covered a lot. Is there anything else you guys want to, want to bring up? Just to remind people to uh, go to stopfinancialsurveillance.org and get your comment in before January 4th. Is there anywhere else people can follow you? You guys on Twitter? Is there anywhere, any, any other resources people should be aware of? Yeah. So again, just to remind folks, our organization is Fight for the Future. Uh, it's fightforthefuture.org is our homepage. You can see all the different campaigns that we work on. And yeah, we're on Twitter and for better or for worse, Instagram and other places as well. Um, so we're easy to find out there in the world. Um, and, you know, certainly if these are issues that you're passionate about, um, come connect with us, write us an email. We're easy to reach. And if you're, you know, if you run a crypto project or something like that, we're definitely building out our network of developers and folks um, that we talk to regularly about these issues. So um, get in touch with us. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we'd love to have your axe in the battle um, to preserve uh, decentralized technology and the potential that it has to change our society for the better. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.